Hi, Nicole here, and I'm back from the American Astronomical Society meeting in Long Beach, California. Uh, we were there for several days. I was there with CosmoQuest doing a table and posters and talks and all kinds of good stuff. I know you've probably seen a lot of stories in the news from the new science coming out of the meeting, but uh, I ran around a bit with my camera to talk to some of the people in the exhibit hall and the poster sessions to see what kind of science they were doing. So I'd like to share that with you, give you a small taste of the kind of stuff that goes on at this very big astronomical conference every year. Thanks. So I am with Katherine Zucker from the University of Virginia. Hello. Hello. Uh, you are an undergraduate doing research with uh, Lisa May Walker and Kelsey Johnson. So can you tell us a little bit about um, what you're working on? Yes. So I study compact groups in the mid-infrared. Um, and compact groups um, are very unique because they are, in terms of galaxy groups, um, they're one of the densest that we currently know. Um, and they're interesting because um, with their prolonged gravitational interactions um, and their high densities, they mimic uh, the conditions of the earlier universe. Um, and they provide a window in which we can see um, the buildup of massive early type galaxies. Um, so they're really cool in terms of that. In color space, they show this clear bimodality. So there's a, there's a bimodality between compact group galaxies that are relatively quiescent. Um, the blue ones and then those that are actively star forming and then there's very few galaxies and compact groups that are moderately star forming and, and scientists really don't know why mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to analyze that um, and I'm using this new uh, mid-infrared camera uh, telescope called WISE it's allowing me to really increase my sample size so I can look at a lot more compact group galaxies um, like this one's so the picture of a compact group um, there's three of them there um, one two and three so how far away is the infall region from the sun? It's at 0.4 BRI. Yeah. 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 It's not. It's at the so secondary. There's a lot of hot you know, gas. Yeah. So it's at the secondary X-ray. Yeah. Secondary X-ray. So my name is Alejo Stark, uh, and I work with uh, Professor Michael Adders at the University of Chicago. And uh, we're looking specifically at a strongly lensed galaxy, so it's a galaxy that's uh, actually otherwise too faint to see. But using sort of our strongest telescope, Hubble, and nature's strongest telescope, uh, a gravitational uh, cluster of galaxies, uh, we, can mag we can get a magnified image of this galaxy and say something about its evolution, perhaps, and uh, what it's made of, and uh, what's happening. We looked at X-ray data from Chandra, and uh, sort of Preliminary data showed, uh, preliminary analysis showed that there's no uh, active black nucleus, which perhaps means that the, ga uh, the galaxy is emitting MG2 uh, perhaps uh, through, through stars. Uh, but we were to verify that, so uh, looking at Hubble data, so optical data, uh, which we're able to do only because this galaxy is being uh, strongly lensed, so we have a magnified image. Um, I looked at the narrowband and broadband images of Hubble um, and uh, determined that there's no point source distribution. So this is the optical lens, and particularly uh, the spectra was taken from this uh, highly distorted but highly magnified part of the galaxy. You see the galaxy here and here. The reality, of course, is sort of tucked away somewhere behind this cluster of galaxies. Right. Sure. Um, Anthony Ford. I'm a senior undergraduate physics major at the University of Texas at Brownsville, um, working with the Center for Advanced Radio Astronomy. Um, so the Low Phasm Project, or Low Frequency All Sky Monitor, is um, just kind of a keeps an eye on the sky at pretty much the entire time, um, looking for for cool events in space such as uh, star in spirals, and it looks in uh, low frequency radio bands, which is about the space underneath your FM dial. Yeah. And so uh, we just kind of look for for really energetic events. They're based on the uh, antenna technology developed by the Naval Research Laboratory mm -hmm. and the uh, and University of New Mexico for the Long Wavelength Array Project. Um, so we're using the, their, their cross dipoles that are sensitive from about 5 megahertz up to about 100 megahertz. Um, we're using them as is with, with absolutely no modifications for the front end technology and uh, we're just setting up a nice uh, phased array to uh, give us sensitivity towards the sky without um, receiving too much of stuff from Earth. Hi, my name is Stan Hasselquist. I'm a fourth year undergraduate at the University of Virginia. And right now I'm studying uh, dwarf seroidal galaxies around the Milky Way, um, in particular the Sagittarius dwarf seroidal galaxy. 
and they're uh, very interesting galaxies because uh, they're dark matter dominated. So when we're studying dark matter and looking at the cusp problem. Um, we want to go to these dwarf spheroidal galaxies to try to learn more about that. The Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy is very interesting because it's currently merging with the Milky Way Galaxy. So not only is it cool because it's this dark matter dominated galaxy, but it's also in the process of merging with our Milky Way. So there's some theories and some models that predict that the Milky Way halo is just made up of um, uh, uh, structures similar to this that have merged with the Milky Way Galaxy. and um, I am doing research on uh, Bell 2061, which is a galaxy cluster. Uh, it is at um, a redshift of 0.078, and we have detected a likely shock in the northeast region with a confirmed temperature enhancement. Uh, the shock is probably associated with a cool plume to the northeast of the cluster, which is probably an infilling subcluster. So if we can reproduce some of the things in a simulation, it's, it's, it's a great thing to be able to see that here. Uh, here. So we have a cool plume, a hot shock here, and it also uh, a southwest relic, which we can see here and here. And um, this simulation also predicts uh, some smaller shocks out past the plume here, which we think could be uh, the cause of this northeast extension here of the radio halo. My name is uh, Alexander Yurik and I go to Western Michigan University. Uh, my project here today is iron mining, edit green A's, archive spectra, archive spectra, and benchmarking of atomic data. We have gone and looked through and we take measurements of looking at edit green A and Orion's nebula and measure the forbidden trans electron transitions in iron 2. And through doing this, we end up with these nice plots that give us um, a good example and show us the intensity, the chi-squared, which is an accuracy of the, me of the measurement, and as well as the sigma-v, which is the profile. And through this, we are able to, uh, and then we use these measurements that we gain to test our theoretical calculations that we have done uh, to say where these are supposed to be and also their intensities. Could you explain what forbidden lines are? Because that sounds kind of provocative. <laughs> <laughs> so they are lines that are quantum mechanically not allowed. They're transitions that electrons don't like to make unless they absolutely have to. Okay. Unless they have no other option, nowhere else to go. Cool. And eventually they jump down to somewhere where they're not necessarily supposed to. <laughs> Pick your favorite. Pick your favorite marble. <laughs> Okay, drop it in. Ooh, See that? pretty good. So you made a nice deep crater. All right, my name is Seth Johnson. I'm from University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And typically in astronomy, people just say, here's my best fit, I'm done. Uh, really, you want to go beyond that. You want to say, okay, what are the errors on these parameters? How, how well do they tie in with one another? Are they degenerated in some fashion? Uh, my code uh, explores that. So. Uh, I've made it so that it's general purpose. It doesn't matter which field of astronomy you're in, uh, what particular models you're particularly interested in, you can use all of those. If you're uh, UV, optical, near IR, radio, you can combine all of those if you like. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, if your templates are theoretical in nature, if you derive them straight from the absolute physics, or if they're empirical derived from various uh, observations that you have of populations of galaxies. You can use all of those here. Hi, my name is Brooke Simmons. I work at the University of Oxford in the Astrophysics Department. I study black holes, in particular supermassive black holes, with masses somewhere between a million and a billion times the mass of the Sun. Every supermassive black hole lives in a galaxy. Every galaxy has a supermassive black hole. And uh, it's a little bit strange, but black holes and galaxies seem to grow together, to know about each other. It's strange because black holes are very, very small, even though they're very massive. For example, why should an ant inside an enormous football stadium be bigger than an ant on a local stadium? 
right? But it is. The bigger the galaxy, the bigger the black hole. We think, or at least some people think, that that happens through mergers, collisions of galaxies. So what we did, with the help of the public actually, through the Galaxy Zoo project, was to find galaxies that have had no big mergers in their history. And the way we know that is because they have this beautiful spiral structure where none of those stars have been transformed into any other kind of configuration that's caused by a merger. So we found merger-free galaxies and we asked what their black holes look like. So if black holes grow in mergers, then they shouldn't have any black holes or they should have very small black holes. But what we found is these big spiral galaxies without any signatures of mergers at all have big black holes too. So that's strange and that's where we are. We don't know why, but we had the public's help to at least ask the question and we're continuing to work. Ready. Well, hello, my name is Alberto Conti. I am the JWST Innovation Scientist and we have a booth here at the uh, uh, AAS 221 in uh, beautiful Long Beach, uh, California. Uh, the booth that you see here is a representation of the primary mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a six and a half meter telescope uh, primary mirror. Uh, we have done a very clever thing here. We have one quarter of the mirror, which is a, a physical piece of, uh, of, uh, of um, of the mirror actually and then we also have uh, mirrors that shows you actually the physical size so I don't know if you can see from there but uh, uh, the mirrors are very large they're reflected across uh, mirrors that we have on the sides and on the floor and so uh, when you come here to our booth you experience the full size of the James Webb Space Telescope if you want to experience something uh, uh, different if you want to take a look at uh, can I still keep going? Yes, okay, okay. yes, go for it. <laughs> Something uh, uh, more personal, I guess. We just released on the iTunes Store an iBook that gives you a, an idea, basically, of the, the, the observatory. It gives you an idea of its, uh, of its science. Uh, you can play with a 3D model of the um, of the actual observatory right at your fingertips, which is pretty cool. You can take a look at the science we're gonna do with this uh, fantastic telescope in 2018. So come visit us at uh, this AAS or the next. Okay, so I'm Ron Albright with NASA SMD, Science Mission Directorate, Science Communication, and I stand in front of the Hyperwall, which is a uh, high visualization, high resolution uh, Hyperwall setup. So here we have nine screens, and they're uh, 46 inch LCDs, so maximum resolution on this setup is 4000 by 2300 pixels. And so basically what we have uh, is we travel nationally and internationally to annual science meetings and we have scientists present their latest findings on the hyperwall in maximum resolution. So the, so the resolution can actually get up to the, the maximum resolution. Uh, the native ca capability of this is 5760 by 3240. So it can actually go above the, uh, the 4000 by 2300. Look at all the Cosmo swag. Cosmo swag. Cosmo swag.